All right, well, this morning we're going to go back uh, to Luke chapter 8, and I've already read the entire text at differing places, so let me just read the portions that we're going to be looking at this morning, and that would be in verses 8 through 10 of Luke chapter 8 and verses 16 through 18. And uh, really, remembering that the versification in the Bible is, is really man-made. There, there was somebody who at some time uh, decided where the chapter breaks and verses would be, and, and he wasn't always the best. Uh, I'm going to read just part of verse 8 because we're only going to deal with um, part of verse 8 uh, through 10 and then 16 through 18. So uh, in verse 8, as he said these things, and, and that is the parable of the sower, he would call out... He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest it is in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now let me just jump ahead to um, verses 16 through 18. Jesus says, now no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen, for whoever has to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. Now, my apologies up front. I'm not going to be dealing with everything that's even in these verses because we've already dealt with them in in previous sermons. But really what I want to focus on today are those three things. How privileged we are to hear the gospel and to know Jesus. Okay, How we are to share that knowledge with other people. And the encouragement we have that there will be those who hear. So by way of review, again, first of all, we've seen that as the gospel is preached, there are going to be four possible responses. Some are going to reject it, our Lord Jesus says. Really, from what we know from experience and from the Bible, most people will. That's certainly what we see happening today. As as we're reminded in the videos we're watching in the evening, the number of people who go to church and profess to be Christians in the Western world are becoming increasingly few. Uh, It's diminishing. And the reasons for that are many. We We won't go into that. But the current excuse people are using to reject the gospel is evolution and millions of years. And that's why we've been challenging this view through that series of evening lectures. But the real reason why these things are declining, and again, there are circumstances as well, Uh, and we're going to be reminded about this this morning, the real reason is spiritual hardness of heart, spiritual blindness. That's the reason why people reject the gospel and they don't go to church is because they don't want to see the light. They don't want it shining to them. Jesus said the reason why people didn't come to him when he came into the world, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness hated the light and wouldn't come to the light because they didn't want their evil deeds to be exposed. They didn't want the way they're living to be, again, confronted by our Lord Jesus. So most people are going to reject the gospel, but others will at least appear to receive it, but as we saw, not be fully committed to it. Some are going to get excited about it. They're going to follow Jesus for a while. They're going to look maybe even like stellar or exemplary Christians, maybe doing a lot for the glory of the Lord, at least it appears that way. But when things get hard and the cost becomes too great, they will abandon him. You know, that's the seed that was sown on the rocky soil. Uh, While others, Jesus tells us, will not be able to free themselves from the temptation of the world. It's just going to be too much for them. They can't give it up. And so they never really get serious about following Jesus. Because remember, to follow Jesus means we do have to give up the world. We have to give up our own lives to follow him. In other words, um, what Jesus was telling us is the majority of those who hear the gospel will not be saved by the gospel. But Jesus also told us that there would be those who would receive the truth. They would receive the gospel. They would hold it fast in their hearts. Their lives would be transformed by it. 
As a matter of fact, we've, we were looking then after that at some of, the, uh, some of the fruits of that, what that transformation actually looks like. We saw in the opening verses of Luke chapter 8 that those who have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, like these women who were following Jesus and supporting him out of their, their means, will give to support the work of the kingdom of heaven. They'll, work, they'll give to support the gospel, but they will also support it through their prayers. We saw that uh, they will also study the word of God. Jesus says, take care how you listen to him who has, more will be given. He's talking about truth. If you listen and hold on to the truth God gives to you, he will give you more. So we know that those who are born again by the Spirit of God will listen to the Word of God, study the Word of God. They will learn as much as they can about the Word of God, but they won't stop there. They will do what actually is pleasing to Him. They will serve the Lord. They will bear fruit uh, with perseverance. They will shine uh, the light, essentially. And they will do that because that's what they want to do, because they love God because they love his kingdom, because they can't do anything else. That's where their heart's at. You know, we always do what is in our hearts to do. That's why it's so important that the kingdom of heaven be in our hearts, the Holy Spirit be in our hearts, that we have those holy affections. Now, this morning, we're going to look at three final things that our Lord shows us in this particular section. And I've already told you what those three things are, that we are blessed, first of all, for believers this morning, to have embraced this truth that we are to share this truth with others and that we are to be confident that there will be those who will receive that truth and actually be saved by it. Okay, now the first thing that our Lord wants us to know is that we are blessed to have embraced the, His truth. Now, we're blessed, first of all, because uh, though the majority of the world today still does not know anything about Jesus. We do know about him. We have the gospel. We need to remember that the gospel is really the only truth. It is the only way that God saves anyone. Let's not forget what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1, verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Why was it that Paul had such boldness in sharing the gospel? Why did he share it with so many people? It's because he knew that was the only way that anyone was going to be saved. He knew that that is what the Lord would use to save them. It wasn't going to be his, just his character and his shining example and how nice he was to other people. Um, it was going to be through the truth. That is how the Lord saves. Now, we do understand that there may be some exceptions to this. We don't want to bank on these exceptions as the way that, that people should be saved. Elect infants die in an infancy. Those that also people who never really fully develop uh, their mental capacity to understand. We know that the Lord still saves among them as well. They don't necessarily have to hear the gospel. At least we would assume that would be the case. But apart from those very narrow exceptions, God only saves through the gospel. You know, that's why he's called us to do the very difficult work, although glorious work, of missions. Think about what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, verses 13 through 15. He says, For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? You see, he's talking about cause and effect. How can somebody actually be saved if they don't hear the gospel? How can they believe in Jesus? But how are they going to hear about Jesus unless somebody goes to them and actually tells them about Jesus? Well, the Lord has in his grace and his mercy brought the gospel to us. We have been blessed to hear it. We have it. As a matter of fact, um, as uh, our Lord Jesus says in other places, we actually know things and see things that the believers in the Old Testament who only had basically the types and shadows, the prophecies, we see what it is that they wanted to see. We understand what it is they wanted to understand. 
Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 13, verse 17, in, in that section where he's dealing with the parables, to his disciples, and the same thing is true of us. For truly I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ even hid these truths from the majority of his own people who were alive at that time? As a matter of fact, that's why he was speaking to them in parables. He says in Luke 8, verse 10, again to his disciples, but again equally true to us, to you... It has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now, you know, I, I think you've, you've heard before that people have said, uh, perhaps other pastors, other Christians, even Bible teachers, theologians, Jesus spoke in parables in order to illustrate or make it more plain to people what he was actually saying. Here he says, he was speaking in parables to hide the truth from those who were hearing because he didn't want them to know, right? This was God's judgment on the Jews for their hardness of heart. But that's not the case with his disciples. They were privileged to be able to see and to hear. And we have that same privilege today. As a matter of fact, we have in the Word of God everything that he intends to reveal to us at least for now. And I think that's what he's talking about in Luke 8, verse 17, where he says this, For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. By the way, for those of you who were here on Wednesday and you were, we were studying parallelisms in the Bible, here is a parallelism. Nothing is hidden that will not become evident or anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Jesus is saying the same thing twice in order to emphasize it. But what exactly is he saying here? Well, he did say something similar to this in Matthew 10, verse 26. Remember, just before Jesus sent his disciples out to preach the gospel in the neighboring towns and villages, he was telling them, don't be afraid to speak because everything that they are doing is going to one day come to light and they are going to be judged by it. And there he was referring to their secret sins Nobody gets away with anything. Everything that a sinner does who doesn't repent is going to be brought out on the day of judgment. It's going to be exposed and he's going to be judged for that if they do not turn from their sins to Jesus. But here he seems to be referring really to the things he was then telling them. The things that he was then keeping from the Jews and I think that this truth was hidden from them so that they might hate Jesus and that they might turn him over to Pilate, to the Romans, to be crucified in order that he might die for our sins. But it was revealed to the disciples because later in their ministry, they would preach these very truths that Jesus was then hiding from them. Well, again, we have that truth preserved for us in the Word of God. So we are, we are blessed. We're blessed to have the Word, just to possess it. But we're even more blessed because we not only have the Word of God, but we've actually received the one the Bible tells us about. We have received the Lord Jesus Christ if we are trusting in Him today. And the reason why we're doing that is because He has given to us His Holy Spirit. Okay? We have received Jesus while most of those who even hear the gospel are going to reject it. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. This is something that we, we don't want to forget. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. The vast majority of mankind is going to go through the broad road to destruction. And even among those who hear the gospel. Remember what Jesus showed us in these first three soils of the parable of the sower? they are not going to bear any fruit. They are not going to be saved by it. The majority of people who hear the gospel are actually going to be lost. And among all those who have heard it, we're among the few who have received it and received him, as he says in verse 14, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Is there any question 
that the vast majority are going to be lost. Only a few are going to be saved. And if you were saved, you're among those privileged few. We need to appreciate the fact, first of all, that we are among a very small minority of people that have been saved by the gospel. And we are to be thankful. So that's the first thing I think that the Lord wants us to see. The disciples were privileged to hear the truth and to be saved by the truth. And there was one exception, of course, and that is uh, Judas. He heard the truth, but he wasn't saved by it. That is a tremendous privilege. We need to be thankful that we have it and that we've been saved by it. But secondly, we need to remember that Jesus has revealed it to us for a specific purpose, not just to save us, but to share this truth with other people. You know, he didn't give us all these privileges and all these blessings. He didn't give us his Holy Spirit merely that we might be safe, although that is one very important reason and I think one that we are very aware of and very thankful for. But he also gave it to us that we might share it with others. Now, I think that's what Jesus has in mind when he says in verse 16 of Luke chapter 8, Now, no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed. But he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying that he has lit us up so that we might shine. You know, it's interesting that Isaiah in, uh, in I think it's Isaiah chapter 60, uh, I don't recall offhand, but he writes about a great light that was going to rise in Galilee and Matthew tells us that that prophecy was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 4, verse 16, he says this, The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Now, does that mean that Jesus began his ministry on the day of a total solar eclipse that was perfectly pitch black outside, and that he somehow was shining when he showed up? No, it was business as usual for the Jews. They didn't know that they were necessarily in the darkness. Maybe a few people did who had received Jesus, basically trusting in him through the prophecies and shadows. But it was talking about the ignorance. It was talking about the immorality that existed in Israel. And here in the middle of that situation, this great light appears. One who is shining with the character of God because he is God in human flesh. And one who is preaching the truth and who is bringing the gospel. Okay, that's the light shining in the darkness. But you see, Jesus has made us to be lights, right? He has given us his light so that we also may shine in this world as he did, and I think in the same two ways in which he did. First of all, in the way in which we live. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The first way in which we are to shine, Jesus says, is by living differently than those who are in the world. When unbelievers listen to us speak, they should hear a difference. Our words should not be like theirs. We shouldn't be tearing people apart and speaking about things we shouldn't be speaking about, but our words should be, as we're reminded by Paul, seasoned with grace. They should build up one another and minister grace to one another, draw others to the Lord. When they look at us, they should see a difference in us. We, we shouldn't look like the world. We shouldn't have the world's image stamped on us. We shouldn't live like the world. We shouldn't serve ourselves like the world. But we should look and we should live and we should serve as Jesus would in this world. Of course, bringing us up to date into the 21st century. As Luther put it, we should be christ to our neighbor. We should be Christ to the world. We should be a reflection of his image. And I said that thing about the 21st century, not to say that we should put on robes, but we need to be like Jesus in character, right? We need to live like Jesus. We need to show people what he's like. What did Jesus come into the world to do except to show us what the Father is like? And then why did he give us his Holy Spirit? 
It's so that we might become like him, so that we might show the world what he is like. So we should ask this question, how are we representing the Lord Jesus? Are we showing the world what Jesus is actually like? Now, secondly, he wants us to shine by sharing his truth with other people. Uh, let's not forget in the parable of the sower that there is a sower, okay? There is somebody who has seed and who is casting that seed in the field. And that person, of course, represents someone who has that treasure, the gospel, and is sharing that gospel with other people. Now, we noted before that Jesus explained this parable secretly to his disciples so that they might later declare these truths. Well, he has given us these truths so that we might basically do the same thing. God calls us, our Lord Jesus calls us to share the truth. He has commissioned us as his ambassadors. He wants us to make disciples of this nation and of all the nations. He wants us to tell them the good news, okay? to tell them about Jesus. That's not a hard thing to do. All of us have the gospel. If we are saved, we already know enough to tell somebody else how they can be saved. We just simply need to do it. Now, finally, though it is true that um, as we shine the gospel that most people are not going to listen to what we have to say, uh, there might be those who listen for a little while and then fall away, as we were, again, reminded through the parable of the sower. Uh, Jesus does want us to be encouraged by the fact that some actually will be saved by the gospel. He's going to bring people to himself. Let's not forget the four soils. Sometimes we get you know, so focused on the first three, we forget about the fourth. And let's also not forget what Jesus said, remember, as he was Preaching this parable as he, as he was speaking, he, he called out in Luke 8, verse 8, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, what does that imply? It implies that there are people who can hear. Okay, hear in a very specific sense. Now, most professing Christians today believe that everyone in the world can hear in the way that they need to hear in order to be saved. But what did Jesus just say? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He didn't say everyone can hear, but only certain people can. Now it is true that everyone can hear what we're saying and can even understand what it is we're saying, but it doesn't mean that they're gonna be able to listen and respond the way that Jesus was calling them to respond. And the reason why they can't do this is because they don't want to do this. This is not a, a physical problem. It's not that they're deaf. You know, it's not that they don't have uh, the ability to, to do what it is that the Lord is calling them to do in a certain sense. They have a moral inability to do this. They don't want to do this because they hate the Lord. And again, we talked about this earlier. This is the condition in which we come into the world, hating God, and so not desiring to honor him. Paul writes this in Romans 8, verses 7 and 8. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. By the way, this isn't talking about a subset of the world. Some people are in the flesh and some people aren't. Uh, this is talking about everybody outside of Christ, okay? You're either in the Spirit or you're in the flesh. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're in the flesh. And if you're in the flesh, you're hostile toward God. You hate God. You can't submit to the law of God. You cannot even receive the Lord Jesus Christ. If he's offered to you, you do not have ears to hear. Paul also writes in Romans 3.11, there is none who understands and sees the value of these things, sees the beauty of the gospel, there is no one who seeks for God. That's the way we are when we come into the world. Now, if that's true, which of course it is true because that's what our Lord says, then how can anyone have ears to hear? How can anyone believe? Well, some can and they will for the same reason that we can, and that's because God is gracious. Um, the Father will bring uh, those who are his 
to the Lord Jesus. Jesus says in John 6, 44, no one can come to me. By the way, can, remember, talks about ability, not permission, not may, but can. No one is able to come to me, he says, unless the Father who sent me draws him. And really, the, um, the language there, draws, is quite strong. It actually means compels him to come. It has to be basically against that person's nature. And we know he does that by changing the heart. Now, he does that, of course, by giving those the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Okay, we were in the flesh and we were basically bound by it. But God gave us his Holy Spirit who set us free from our flesh so that we could trust in the Lord Jesus. He also, Jesus says this in John 6, verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. We need the new birth of the Holy Spirit the Father brings people to Jesus by giving them the Holy Spirit, and then the Spirit, when He comes, opens our ears to hear Jesus calling. You know, that passage I read earlier from Romans chapter 10, how will they basically hear Him unless somebody is sent to preach? We often understand that as basically um, how are they going to hear the gospel unless somebody is sent to preach? But what it's actually saying is how are they going to hear Christ? unless somebody is sent to preach. Because when somebody is preaching the word of God, Christ is essentially speaking to that person. Now that's what Jesus means then when he says this in John 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The Spirit of God opens their ears to hear Jesus speaking through the gospel. And when they hear his voice, they follow him. Notice, they follow Jesus. That's the fourth soil. That's the fruit. They trust him. They turn from their sins. They follow him. That's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. And of course, with the Spirit of God opening our ears and hearing the voice of Jesus, they will come to Jesus. And when they come to Jesus, he will receive them. Jesus says in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. But you see, they're only going to come to Jesus if they hear his voice, right? Somebody has to go and preach. But they will only hear his voice through the gospel, which is why we need to share it, because we're the ones who have it. Okay? The Lord gave it to us in order to change us, but he also gave it to us in order to share it with others. That's how they hear the voice of the Lord Jesus. Now, not everybody who hears is going to be saved, but God is going to send his Holy Spirit to some, and they will hear the voice of Jesus, they will trust him, and they will be saved. We need to share this truth. We need to give the treasure away, share it with other people. Now, it is true that it's becoming increasingly likely that if we do this, we will be persecuted for doing this, if we stand out for him, if we speak his truth. But, you know, it's equally true that this is the only way that anyone's going to be saved, right? So there's kind of a dilemma. We can keep ourselves safe, hide in a room like Peter and the disciples, and we'll be safe, but these people are going to perish. But if we're to reach out to them, it might mean persecution, but... People are going to be safe. The Lord's going to bring people to himself. So what do we need? Well, we need a couple of things. And actually, it really revolves down into one. We need courage and we need compassion, okay? If we have compassion, it will give us the courage to overcome our fears and we will reach out to them. But how do we get compassion? How do we get courage? Well, the Lord's actually already given it to us. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and, and discipline. He's given us the Holy Spirit. What we need is to stop quenching the Spirit, stop grieving the Spirit, stop offending the Spirit, and begin doing the things that basically the Spirit loves and, and is moving us to do. 
get into his word, get into prayer, begin to yield to him, begin to share the gospel with other people, stop doing the things that, again, you know are offensive to him, and his influence will get stronger in your heart. Your compassion will grow, and as your compassion grows, so will your courage to reach out to people you may otherwise be afraid to reach out to, and you'll be able to share the gospel. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to come to Christ, but they're never going to come if you don't go and share the gospel with them. So we go to them, we speak to them, we pray for them, and we realize that his sheep are going to hear his voice and they are going to come. We don't know who they are, so we speak to everyone we can, knowing that the Lord is going to bring them. So let's, let's do that. Let's seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to shine the light that the Lord has given to us in this world. And let's know that as we do that, the Lord is going to save people. There are going to be people who are safe in heaven because we're willing to do what the Lord calls us to do. And we'll not only be thankful that he used us, but those people will also be thankful and we will give glory and praise to our Lord. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to encourage us uh, to, to share more of what he has given to us.